9,000 years ago, they invented the first artificial building material. Smooth, clean, and waterproof, it was instantly popular. Plaster. I don't think it's entirely utilitarian or, or functional. It's to do with uh, ideas of home as opposed to just having a house to live in. It's, it's making a place uh, which has all sorts of formal and symbolic uh, values attached to it, just indeed as the houses we live in have all sorts of um, ways, keys, which tell you how you should behave in this room. Shall we eat in the kitchen? Very informal. Let's have supper in the dining room, and it's quite different. Plaster was extremely versatile and turns up in many sites. In 1974, Jordanians digging a main road to Amman discovered the Stone Age ruins of Ain Ghazal. Here, Gary Rolofson was able to document on film the story of plaster. What we're looking at is a Neolithic house with a beautiful plaster floor with a central hearth for heating and for cooking and for, uh, for light. The plaster is of excellent quality, very sophisticated. Ain Ghazal was a large, impressive town with hundreds of houses. Plaster was part of its dazzle. Every house had to have a lime plaster floor. That's expensive. It's expensive because lime does not exist as a natural resource. Lime has to be manufactured, and it's among the first artificial materials that were ever produced by humans. It comes from burning limestone. And in order to burn limestone, you have to reach high temperatures. The temperatures have to be sustained for long periods of time, and this requires a lot of fuel. Every time that you make a floor at these 50 square meter houses, we figure that you're using at least six trees. In these houses, Rolofson found evidence of a traditional burial. The plaster covered a body with no skull, a ritual developed 3,000 years earlier. They buried the body beneath the floor and came back sometime later opened up the burial pit again and then removed the skull. Bodies were also ritually exposed to birds of prey outside the town. Then they used building plaster in a new way to preserve images of the dead. The face was recreated. A portrait was, was made of the deceased using plaster that was modeled and molded into those particular characteristics that identify grandfather from uncle from aunt. It's an ancestor veneration cult, if you will, that we have a sequence of these people who are being selected in order to establish this connection with the past, this connection with the land, and perhaps then the connection with the house. The Smiths, for example, will be able to trace their genealogy back from this ancestor to this ancestor to this ancestor, all the way back into time. Eventually, you come to this very dim past where even if there's a name out there, you're not really sure what the name means anymore. You get back into this mystical, foggy area of the so far back in time that you're not really certain how the connections work anymore. These mystical ancestors, we think we found. In the laboratory, researchers removed the rubble hiding the statues. After 8,000 years, they revealed life-size figures, just the way they were made. There's a gift for simplicity which takes these figures beyond the portraits of known ancestors. Instead of being the real ancestors, we think they're the mythical ancestors of the people who lived at Ain Ghazal, if not in the entire region. We see at least three pairs of statues that have two heads. 
We already have the symbolism involved of the statues representing mythical ancestors altogether. What we're beginning to see is that we have the Ein Ghazal smiths and the Jericho smiths being represented in the same body. So we have two parts of the same line uh, coming together symbolically. These figures are tied into the spiritual life of the early farmers. The evidence for their religion is pieced together from fragments scattered across the region. The origins of the puzzle are found at Jerf al -Akmar. In the middle of the town, Daniel Stodur found a completely unexpected building. It was much larger, not a house, but something else. Massive wild cattle horns were found lying where they'd fallen from the wall. Upturned headless humans were carved into a continuous bench. Watching over them were the rearing figures of vultures. This is the earliest known public building. Townspeople could gather together under one roof. After 700 years of use, something terrible happened. We found a skeleton that was almost complete, but that had no head. No head, the head was taken off. It was the skeleton of a young girl, probably between 15 and 18 years. And this skeleton, this girl, was not buried, just thrown up on the soil. The girl's hands were twisted in rigor mortis. Within hours of her death, the whole building caught fire and her body was covered in burning timber. violent end for a mysterious place. They're not normal houses, they're not meeting rooms for political debate, they're, they're some, some kind of special building in which some kind of special activities go on. So I think you probably have to think in terms of religious activity, religious belief systems operating at all sorts of different levels. People were coming together to worship they left small stone tokens with intricate designs. Their meaning remains unknown. We found associations of figures, animal figures, and signs. You can see, for example, here that you have a fox, a kind of snake, undulated lines, and here, if I turn it, you have a vulture. These combinations of figures tell a story, a myth, associating death and the vulture, death and the bird of prey. Big birds of prey are taking with them, up in the air, bodies, human bodies without heads. These images of death occur all across the region. Vultures swoop on bodies, taking off the heads. Centuries later, they spread as far as Gobekli Tepe, 800 kilometers away in Turkey. Archaeologists are slowly digging away an entire hill they're finding groups of standing stones, twice human height. They're beautifully carved with symbolic figures. The bull, the lion, the snake, and the fox. <laughs> 